that very nice uh, introduction, and thank you to Nestle Health Science for inviting me here today. These are my disclosures, and you might notice I don't have a reason for this, but it only seems to be the companies whose names start with N, like me to speak in their symposia. So, I'm interested in the microbiome and how it interacts with the host immune system. And the microbiome is um, a very hot topic and has been now for a couple of years. And I think it has really challenged us, these recent uh, findings on the microbiome, as to actually what does it mean to be human? So over half the cells in the human body are not human at all, they're bacterial. These bacterial, or this bacterial metagenome encodes over two million genes, so far, far more genes than what are present in the human. Uh, many of these genes encode for enzymes which release a whole range of different metabolites. Some of these metabolites can be absorbed and can have effects distant to the organ where that bacteria lives. And as an immunologist, I think we really realize now that we have grossly underestimated the complexity and the intimacy of the interactions between bacteria and the immune system. We have such a huge amount of foreign antigen present on our mucosal surfaces, and we don't react aggressively usually to that foreign antigen. So there's very potent tolerance mechanisms in play. And I think if we can understand how those mechanisms work, we will learn a lot about the processes of natural tolerance. And in the allergy arena, of course, that's very important for us to understand better. So also during the last few years, there's been many new mechanisms have been discovered for how the immune system sees these bacteria, reacts to these bacteria, which bacterial components and metabolites can influence the immune system. This is a short talk today, so unfortunately I don't have time to go through uh, any of these in great detail. But if we stand back for a second, what I'd like you to appreciate is all your favorite cell types are here uh, on this picture. Every cell type within the gut can be influenced by bacteria, either directly or indirectly. Ultimately, what we like to see in the allergy world, of course, um, is the induction of B regulatory cells and T regulatory cells. And microbes can have direct effects on the polarization of these lymphocytes, but also can have very dramatic effects on the innate immune system, driving tolerogenic innate pro uh, uh, responses, which ultimately culminate in uh, pushing a, an adaptive regulatory response. So we're not born with a full microbiome. This develops over the first few years of life. And many studies have shown this. I, I'm just using this one as an example. I like this study because it results just from one infant that is sampled multiple times over the first uh, 900 days of life. So every dot here is a sampling time from a single infant. And what you can appreciate is on the y-axis here is diversity measures. You get an increase in diversity over that time. But you can also, because this is from one infant, you can see some of the time points are very, very far away from that line that shows this gradual increase. And those are time points, for instance, associated with a change in diet or the use of something like antibiotics. And on the right, uh, this is the same data, but now we're looking at the individual OTUs. And so I, what I hope you can appreciate is it's not the same bacteria all the time from the beginning to the end. You get this succession of different bacterial species that can survive over the first few years of life. And a lot of this is related to change in dietary habits. So in the allergy and asthma world, um, Changes in microbes on the skin, in the gut, in the lung have all been associated with atopic dermatitis, food allergy, and asthma. Many of these changes happen after disease starts, but also some studies have shown that some of these changes actually precede any obvious signs of disease symptomology. And I will give you just a couple of examples. Again, this is just an example, but there's one study where they looked in the neonatal period, uh, and based on 16S sequencing, they were able to divide neonates into three microbiota types. So neonate gut microbiota one, two, and three. And what was interesting is those neonates who had the microbiota type three, when they got older, they had much higher rates of sensitization. And so that early microbial change was associated with a greater risk of being sensitized to allergen later in life. And the bacteria that were lower in these neonates was Bifidobacterium, Acomantia, and Fecalibacterium. These are bacterium that are coming up again and again and again as being very important for immune system development. 
And just to show how different some of these microbiomes can be, this is a study that came out just a couple of months ago, uh, which I really like. What they did was they transferred the microbiota from kids with cow's milk allergy or healthy infants to previously germ-free mice. Now, germ-free mice, you can very easily induce an anaphylactic response in a food allergy model. They get much more severe responses than a conventionally colonized animal. What these authors showed was mice colonized with a microbiota from a cow's milk allergic infant, there was no protection against a germ-free mouse, whereas those who were colonized with a microbiota from a healthy infant were protected from an anaphylactic response. So demonstrating there's a big difference here in how the immune system um, can be sensitized and react to a food allergen uh, in these two very different microbial uh, populations. When they looked within the gut and they looked at gene expression, you can see very, very different uh, genes being expressed depending on where the microbes came to colonize the animals. I'm not going to go through all of this, but actually a lot of these uh, genes are metabolism related, not immune related. And again, I'm not going to go into it today, but metabolism is more and more being understood to be very important for immune development. So one of the bacteria that they saw was much less in the kids who had cow's milk allergy was this OTU, which relates to this bacterium and aerostepes. And if they just gave the, this particular bacterium to the germ-free mice, then they were able to have a protective effect. So we're not saying that all the effect is due to this one bacterium, but it just show you that searching for some of these really, really good bacteria uh, can result in the identification of a small number, perhaps, of strains that can have benefit. We can look at this a different way. So Supinda's study looked at kids who already had cow's milk allergy, um, and then she looked to see which ones of them spontaneously resolved and which ones had persistent food allergy or cow's milk allergy a few years later. And she found a very big difference in the microbial composition of these kids. And so there was more Clostridia firmicutes in the kids that uh, developed spontane or spontaneously resolved, whereas there was more of these in those who had persistent uh, uh, food allergy. Now, interestingly, the anaerostepes that I just mentioned to you in the previous study is actually in the phylum firmicutes and in the class of Clostridia. So they didn't identify it specifically in this study, but it is in the same grouping of, of microbes. So what influences microbiome development? I told you that this occurs over the first few years of life, and if you get differences in microbiome development, this can increase your risk of allergies and asthma. And there's a huge number, actually, of environmental exposures and lifestyle events that have been shown to impact on the acquisition of and development of the early gut microbiota. And many people talk about the hygiene hypothesis, but I think that does not explain many of these uh, interactions. And what I would like to propose to you is actually maybe we need to think about it in a different way, taking three different factors into account, dispersal, survival, and extinction. So dispersal refers to dispersal of microbes from other sources to the young infant. Uh, survival means giving the microbes, once they're in there, something they can survive on, which are usually, we think, dietary factors, for example, HMOs. And then extinction events. So do you hit the microbiome with things that kill a lot of the bugs and then it can't be recovered? For example, antibiotics. And in this model as well, uh, we propose that actually a lot of the events that we, we see delay the maturation of the microbiome are involved with current day lifestyle and social structures and social interactions. And also having multiple um, risk factors does have an additive effect. So if you have a kid born by C-section and is not uh, breastfed and uh, you know, is the first child in the family and has a very small social group, etc., the impact on their microbiota is much greater than a child that has only one of those uh, factors, which you can see here down in the end if you look at the response to antibiotics. So in this particular child, it takes a long, long time to recover after an antibiotic exposure because they have low rates of dispersal from other people. Whereas in this child, there's a rapid recovery because it's in a situation of a high uh, dispersal. So I mentioned metab or that diet is very important for immune system development related to the microbiota. This is a study from the Pasture Ephraim cohort uh, published a, a few years ago. And what Caroline Redout saw was that 
uh, yogurt or vegetable or fruit consumption in the first year of life reduce the children's chance of getting food allergy, atopic dermatitis or asthma by one half. It was a 50% reduction in risk just if they ate these in the first year of life. So with Caroline, we were really trying to figure out why would that be? And what we thought was maybe it was these uh, fibres that are in fruits and vegetables, for instance, when they get into the gut and they're fermented by gut bacteria, you get secretion of short-chain fatty acids, butyrate, propionate and acetate. And we thought that these could be mediating some of the anti-inflammatory and immune maturation effects. So just recently, we were able to gain access to just over 300 uh, fecal samples uh, from 300 children in this study. And what we're able to show is those kids who had the highest butyrate levels at one year of age had a hugely significantly reduced risk of IgE sensitization to allergen, whether it be inhalant or food allergens, at school age, which in this case was at six years of age. Propionate was somewhat protective, and acetate at least didn't associate with any protective effect in this study. And when we look back at these kids, actually we saw a very nice correlation between butyrate concentrations and the child's consumption of yogurt, fish, and fruits and vegetables in the first year of life. So we feel that these fruits and veg are giving the fibres that are being metabolised, not by us, but by the microbes in the gut, leading to these metabolites which have immune regulatory effects. And I think of relevance to today, uh, during breastfeeding, of course, those oligosaccharides, as you've already heard, are metabolized by gut bacterium. And there's two uh, recent studies that have looked at the um, HMO composition of breast milk and tried to see, is there an influence on allergic outcomes in the infants later? And both studies conclude that, yes, there is. So the study on the left looked at individual oligosaccharides in human breast milk and looked at which uh, are, was there a difference between the levels uh, in the mums uh, for their kids who got food allergy later in life. And some of the oligosaccharides were different um, and did associate with a higher risk of a cow's milk protein allergy. The study on the right was a completely separate study and they used a more modelling type effort where they put all of these together into one model, all the HMOs. But they concluded the same thing in the end, that yes, there's a significant difference in the mother's milk HMO composition and the related risk of the offspring to get uh, sensitised to food allergens. So with that, uh, I will finish up on this slide. Uh, I simply want to say that microbes are incredibly important for uh, development of the immune system, the promotion of uh, immunological tolerance, and consequently in the disease that I work mostly in, in, in allergy and asthma, uh, microbes uh, have a very dramatic effect. Now, how do you promote those microbes? How do you promote their metabolism? How do you promote them to secrete immune regulatory molecules? A lot of that comes down to diet. So really it's a continuum of, of effects that you need the right diet and the right microbes, which gives you the right metabolites that will drive appropriate immune function. Thank you very much for your time.